Hello, this is Little Green Ghouls, and welcome back to Goosebumps Revisited, a series where I break down a classic Goosebumps book and any episode that goes along with it. I will also be toying up some of our Goosebumps cliches and classic moments. This week, I'm excited to visit The Werewolf of Fever Swamp. But before we get started, I again want to quickly share my interview with Mike Vaughn from Geek Vibes Nation, in case you missed it last week. It was a lot of fun, and we were able to talk about my channel, future plans, horror movies, and Halloween. Definitely check it out. I put the link in the descriptions because I learned that I don't have enough subscribers yet to actually put a link on the screen. Thanks, YouTube. On that note, a lot of you are weekly viewers according to the data, but not subscribed, so please consider subscribing so I can keep unlocking fun YouTube features. Okay, on to the episode. Before revisiting it this week, the Werewolf of Fever Swamp was one I was super excited about because I love werewolves, and clearly I didn't remember this book at all because boy was I disappointed. Despite having werewolf in the title, there just isn't a whole lot of werewolf action in this one. We do, however, get a lot of swamp hermit fun, so if that intrigues you, go ahead and read the book first. When looking at the original cover, it's one of my all-time favorites. I love everything about it. And yes, my werewolf love is influencing this. The acid green swamp, an eerie full moon, a hungry looking wolf, and a mysterious heap of clothes, and basically just an ode to my favorite color scheme with all these greens, purples, and blues. I just think it's overall great. The 2003 version loses some points for me because it just kind of mutes the colors with this gray slime border and cuts out the purples. I don't know, they just kind of make it look a little bit more dull by having the wolf be the sole focus versus letting the rest of the swamp shine. And really, this book is more about the swamp than it is about any werewolf. The 2009 version is a dumpster fire in comparison to the original. There's no getting around it for me. This like supposed werewolf looks like a giant swamp rat gazing up at a moon made of cheese. I'll give it some points for the fireflies and the mangrove trees though, but that's it. Thankfully, we're back to having some merchandise this week with the usual trading cards and a pog, but we also have these really fun werewolf slippers so you can run around like the swamp monster you were born to be, as well as a werewolf of fever swamp nightlight in case the moon isn't full enough, I guess. Plus, this awesome werewolf skateboard that probably wouldn't do great in a swamp. There's also, of course, a puzzle of the cover and this cool lithiograph that I really want to own. Some versions of the book also included a little tear-out calendar too, which isn't nearly as fun as a tear-out mask, but it's still fun. Our front take says, who's afraid of the big bad wolf? And it's me, I am. This is of course from the Three Little Pigs, and I am ashamed to say that that wolf scared me when I was little. The back take says, what big teeth you have? Which is another fairy tale reference, this time from Little Red Riding Hood, and I don't recall being afraid of the wolf in that one though. Maybe because he spends so much time dressed as a grandma in a nightgown? Come in. Before we get into the summary, let's read the blurb on the back. There's something horrible happening in Fever Swamp. Something really horrible. It started with a strange howling at night. Then there was a rabbit, torn to shreds. Everyone thinks Grady's new dog is responsible. After all, he looks just like a wolf, and he seems a little on the wild side. But Grady knows his dog is just a regular old dog, and most dogs don't howl at the moon, or disappear at midnight, or change into terrifying creatures when the moon is full. Or do they? The book begins with our introduction to Grady, who's just recently moved from Vermont to Florida, and he lets us know by page one that something lives in that swamp, and it doesn't want him there. Based off the cover, I think it's safe to say that that something is a werewolf, or at least it better be or I'll feel robbed. Grady's a little explorer at heart, and he can't wait to march around the new swamp he lives in. His relocation to the swamp is a result of his father's work, which is interesting. His dad is some sort of goosebump scientist who wants to see if South American swamp deer can thrive in the Florida swamps. So he brought six deer to release and just track them. This seems questionable to me, because I'm pretty sure Florida already has a massive problem with non-native invasive species. I don't think they'll appreciate adding swamp deer to the mix. Also, I was doing some googling to see these cute creatures, and it sounds like swamp deer are actually from India. Marsh deer, however, are from South America, so look at me learning. While admiring this swamp with binoculars, we get an introduction to yet another bird child. This time, it's Grady's older sister, Emily. Apparently she's tall, thin, and she looks a lot like a crane. The Goosebumps universe is full of homely bird children, apparently. The siblings actually head into the swamp to do some adventuring, and it sounds about as pleasant as a swamp can be. Lots of insects and decaying things in the muck. They are both surprised by how loud it is because of all the various creatures running around in there. Swamps sound like my personal nightmare, but I do have some love for them considering my partner is a Cajun swamp creature himself. They're having a pretty good time in the swamp, all things considered, minus one fake alligator scare, which is another one of the major reasons I don't trust Florida in general. Alligators are basically dangerous dinosaurs to me. In a chapter cliffhanger, Grady's admiring some disgusting sludgy water when Emily declares it's quicksand and then two hands shove him from behind right into it. It's just a prank, bro. It was of course Emily, and she pulls him right back before he can fall in. It was so clearly Emily the whole time, I don't know why we made it a chapter cliffhanger. I guess our swamp time was just going too peacefully and Stein wanted to spice things up a bit. 
Emily then dropped some knowledge on the difference between quicksand and peat bogs that I'm thankful for. We learned about this last year when we were studying the wetlands and the rainforest, she replied smugly. The pond is thick because it has peat moss growing in it. The peat moss grows and grows and grows. It absorbs 25 times its own weight in water. After educating her brother and some more exploring, they both decide that they're too sweaty and itchy to continue, because Florida, only to realize they're completely lost. Our last set of lost siblings in Welcome to Dead House were completely lost for an entire chapter too, only to walk around the block and not be lost and nothing happened. So this lost adventure better be more interesting. Emily goes into a panic, but Grady is cool and scientific, and immediately begins figuring out the position of the sun so he can compare it to the direction the moss is growing on the trees. Grady is a natural survivalist. Well, actually, I spoke too soon because Grady comments he actually doesn't even know what moss looks like. So these children are solidly lost and I appreciate it. After some more wandering, they locate the bog from earlier and when Grady's feeling relief, his ankle suddenly gets snatched by something from the swamp and it takes him down in a chapter cliffhanger. It turns out it was just one of those scary trees from Snow White and he tripped over a root. Despite finding a past location, these kids are still lost and they now have stumbled upon a mysterious shack in the middle of the swamp. Based off a recent campfire and some work beats outside, they conclude that somebody's still around and they're going to go ask them for directions. I've learned from horror movies that I'll take my chances wandering lost versus disturbing a potential swamp murderer in a shack. When they go to open the door, it bursts open and a dirty old man pops out and scares them. Emily doesn't hesitate running full speed and leaves her younger brother behind. Grady takes off too eventually, only to realize that the angry dirty old man is chasing after them. They seemingly take off at random into the swamp, but this ends up being fine because they just lose the old man and emerge outside their house. They inform their parents of their adventure, and their dad assures them that the old man is just a well-known local swamp hermit and is perfectly harmless, even though his kids just told him that the hermit chased them. We cut to dinner where we talk more about the swamp deer, and the kids learn that the swamp is known as Fever Swamp. They don't know the title of the book they're in, so this is understandable. After dinner, Grady's out back when we get a shoulder scare cliffhanger, where Grady thinks the swamp hermit has him again, but this is just a new character named Will. Will is 12 just like Grady because this is a Goosebumps book, and it's mandatory that all the kids be 12 aside from Carly Beth. Will thought Grady looked 11, which Grady takes as a personal insult, you know because there's such a huge difference between 11 and 12, but he's able to move past this in hopes of making a new friend. Will lets Grady know that there's a girl their age who lives in their little neighborhood too, but she's pretty weird. Grady asks why it's called Fever Swamp, and we learn that 100 years ago, everyone who went into the swamp came down with a strange fever, started talking crazy, and some died. It sounds like a biohazard and a good excuse to stay indoors. Grady gets to one-up Will's scary story and lets him know that he was chased by the swamp hermit. This impresses Will, and they agree to go explore the swamp together sometime. Unfortunately for Grady though, he immediately catches himself some swamp fever and spends the next few days having weird dreams and hearing angry howls outside of his house. On one of these nights, there's a full moon, and Grady goes to investigate the source of the howling because it sounds like it's extra close. Once in the kitchen, he hears scratching at the door, and he is startled when Emily appears because she heard the howls too. They nervously joke in the kitchen until the scratching starts again. Grady is unaware he's in a werewolf book still, so his stupid ass just flings the door open to go investigate. He's lucky that he's not immediately mauled, and then it turns out there's nothing outside. Even the deer are fine. Emily yanks him back in, and his dad finally comes to investigate why the children are up after midnight. He's not concerned about the howling and the door scratching. After he hears the deer are okay. Priorities. The next morning, Grady's fever is gone, and he heads over to Will's house to see if he's up to do some swamp exploring. When he leaves the house, he is suddenly attacked by some sort of furry monster in a chapter cliffhanger but this monster just ends up being a very large, happy dog. We spend half a chapter with Grady begging to keep the dog. It's also noted many times that this dog is extremely large and possibly part wolf, so they conclude he must be the one scratching at the door and howling. Will confirms he's never seen the dog in their neighborhood of six houses, so Grady names the dog Wolf, and it seems like he's probably going to get to keep it. That afternoon, Grady and Will head into the swamp, and after some debate over the realities of quicksand, they both hear footsteps following them. Both boys quickly decide it's the swamp hermit and run and hide. It of course just ends up being Wolf, and I'm like, why wouldn't you bring Wolf with you to start with? Like, if he's so large and intimidating, just in case if that swamp hermit does show up again. The boys continue on their way and have a grand old time throwing things into the bog to see if they'll sink. Suddenly, Wolf starts growling into the swamp, and both boys hide again. They see the swamp hermit walk by with blood all over his shirt, carrying a mysterious sack. The hermit passes through without further event, and Wolf goes back to being a happy dog. Grady and Will take this as their cue to leave the swamp and head home. On the way back, they come across a mutilated crane, and no, it's not Emily. The bird has been completely shredded with blood and feathers everywhere. I'm assuming guts too, but Stein doesn't go there. Will declares that the swamp hermit must have just tore this bird apart for fun, and that's why he has blood all over his shirt. Grady finds this unlikely and points out the paw prints all around the crime scene. Grady reports what he saw to his dad, who just reminds him that nature is all about survival of the fittest. Grady points out that this bird had been torn in two, and his dad says, maybe another bird did it. 
This conversation leaves Grady feeling concerned, and we cut to that night where he's feeling a little bit better because Wolf is sleeping in his room. He falls asleep only to be woken up later in the night in a chapter cliffhanger by a crash in the living room, and Grady thinks somebody's breaking in. Home invasion is always my first thought too, even if it's just a small creek. This ends up being Wolf trying his best to break out of the house. He's losing his shit and has flipped a table and broken a lamp and is about to bust through the living room window to get outside. They open the door and he takes off into the swamp. This ends Wolf's indoor dog days, and the dad declares that Wolf is probably just used to sleeping outside and that's why he's acting this way. Sure dad, that makes sense. The fun's not over for tonight though because Grady wakes up again to angry howls behind the house near the deer pen. He spots a large creature on all fours racing off into the swamp and he's certain it's not Wolf. He then spots something in the dark by the pin and hops out of the window to go investigate it. This would not be me in a million years. I don't think Brady is brave. I think he's dumb as hell. Surprise, it's not a pile of rags. It's a shredded rabbit that's been torn in half and missing an ear. This nearly makes Grady join the vomit count, but he chokes it back down. He hears triumphant howls in the swamp and he decides to scamper back inside. The next morning, Grady shows his dad the dead bunny and it doesn't go over well. Emily starts declaring that Wolf is a killer and wants to get rid of him ASAP. The dad says it's too quick to make that kind of judgment, so they need more time before deciding what to do with Wolf, but wants everybody to be really careful around him, which is pretty good advice considering this giant ass dog just emerged out of the swamp out of nowhere. The next morning, Will comes over and mentions that one of their neighbors, Mr. Warner, is missing. It turns out he'd been in the swamp hunting turkeys and never returned. Grady thinks maybe he just got lost, but Mr. Warner is old and he knew the swamp too well for that. Suddenly, a new voice from behind him says, maybe the werewolf got him. And it's about time these characters start talking about werewolves, we're over halfway through this book. This mysterious voice belongs to Cassie, the other kid around Grady's age in the neighborhood. Will and Cassie joke back and forth by beating on each other nonchalantly. Eventually the conversation comes back to werewolves and Cassie is insistent that a werewolf lives in the swamp. We get a chapter cliffhanger fake out, where Grady thinks Cassie is pointing at Wolf and calling him a werewolf, but actually the swamp hermit has suddenly appeared. The swamp hermit is not very hermity considering we've seen him multiple times. Cassie keeps referring to the hermit as a werewolf, and he finally hears her, which results in him laughing hysterically and howling at the kids while declaring, I'm the werewolf. The kids take off running from the swamp, only they find themselves being chased by this man. We get another chapter cliffhanger where Grady thinks that the hermit has him, and this time at least he actually kinda does. The hermit tells Grady he was just joking and that he's not going to bite him. Well, that's nice of him. Wolf appears, and he doesn't seem so hostile towards the hermit this time. The hermit tells Grady to watch out for Wolf, and then leaves. Grady's confused because Wolf isn't treating the Hermit like a threat and the Hermit actually just kind of seems like a sad old man. As Grady is walking back home, he's so distracted in his thoughts that he steps right onto a stake and gets bit. The pain is so bad it nearly makes him black out. This is another prime example of why I wouldn't be wandering in a swamp. He reaches his house and Will and Cassie run to get Grady's dad. Cassie tells everyone he's been bit by a werewolf and Grady's like no dipshit it was just a snake. Since the snake is green, I guess we don't have to worry about it being poisonous, or at least that's what Grady's dad says, so this snake bite ends up being not that big of a deal. You know, we have about 20 pages left, and there's been a severe lack of werewolves in this book. They should have called it the Hermit of Fever Swamp, because that's where all the drama is centered. The family makes some jokes about the father being a werewolf because he has a hairy back, and then the mom suddenly comments, Enough werewolf talk. Look, I've got hair growing on my palms. Now, I've learned from reading Dracula that the origins of hair on your palms is all about masturbation because they used to say that masturbating makes your palms hairy. And Dracula had hairy palms, so that was extra scandalous to the Victorians. So anyways, in summary, Grady's mom is clearly a chronic masturbator. That night, Will and Cassie come over for dinner and we're treated to multiple pages of these two arguing and I guess joking around. I don't know, these are tedious characters when they're put together. Maybe this is just preteen romance and I'm not the target audience. We hop to that night and Grady wakes up to the sound of howls once again. They get closer and closer so Grady of course puts on some clothes to go investigate. Something crashes right outside the house and this only makes Grady head outside faster because this child has no sense of self-preservation. Once outside he finds that a deer has been slaughtered. He alerts his parents and once everybody's inside and all settled down, the dad declares that Wolf is a killer and he's going to have to go to the pound because he found a paw print near the crime scene. This causes Grady to insist that a werewolf is doing all these things, which is a very hard argument to win with. In the morning, Dad returns from town and says that everybody is freaking out about the animal killings, howls, and a missing Mr. Warner. He says that Wolf has to go to the pound now, but Grady races outside and chases Wolf off into the swamp before his dad can get him. We literally have 13 pages left, and we've yet to even get an actual description of a werewolf. I am full of disappointment and sorrow. We jump to nighttime where he is, and I know this may really surprise you, again woken up by howls. He spots Wolf growling in the backyard at the swamp. He concludes that the most logical thing to do is to crawl out the window and follow the dog into the swamp, because he thinks if he sees the werewolf firsthand, his parents will suddenly think they're real, and not just a story created to save the dog from the pound. 
Once outside, Grady hears footsteps coming at him quickly, and it ends up being Will who claims to have heard howling too, and wanted to see what was up. Will better be a fucking werewolf, so at least we could just see one. Also, we learn from Welcome to Dead House, if another child appears uninvited in the middle of the night, that child is the evil one. They follow Wolf together for a bit, but suddenly they get separated after losing track of Wolf. The full moon comes out from behind the clouds, and Grady realizes he's right by the hermit shack. This has Grady freaked out, because he's still under the impression that the hermit is the werewolf, even though that is way too obvious. Suddenly we get a chapter cliffhanger, where the werewolf bursts out from behind a tree and knocks Grady to the ground. We finally get to find out what this thing looks like, and it's a bit lackluster. As the yellow light of the full moon shone down, I gazed into the face of the werewolf as it pinned me to the ground. Its dark eyes glared out at me from a human face, a human face covered in wolf fur. It howled in rage, its animal snout opened wide to reveal two gleaming rows of wolf fangs. It's a human wolf I realized in my terror, a werewolf. After realizing the werewolf is Will, Grady tries to get away, but Werewill overpowers him and bites Grady right on the shoulder. This causes Grady to black out, and when he comes to, Wolf leaps onto Werewill. The two rustle around eventually, and Wolf succeeds in chasing Werewill off. Grady then proceeds to faint. He wakes up in his bed because apparently the Swamp Hermit carried him home. Grady explains everything to his parents who listen and then decide to go pay Will a visit. When his dad returns, he reveals that Will is gone, and that the house is empty like nobody's lived there for months. This brings Grady relief because that means the Werewolf is gone, even though it really doesn't make that much sense. Werewill bites Grady and then skips town. We get our cheesy happy ending, where Grady finds out he gets to keep Wolf and they all live happily ever after. Except on the last page, Grady jumps to one month later, and he's in his bedroom window, sprouting fur, growing a snout and popping fangs, and he's ready to explore the swamp with Wolf in his new form as Were Grady. And that's how this one ends. A werewolf book with an extreme lack of werewolf scenes. All I remembered about this episode was that there was for sure more werewolf action than in the book, and I remember the hermit being more menacing. As far as notable actors go, we have Brendan Fletcher who played Grady, and he's also in Freddy vs. Jason, and he plays Mark Davis who gets murdered by Freddy Krueger. So many Goosebumps kids ended up in these movies. Hey, Mark. You didn't forget about me, did you? This episode starts out strong with an intro from R.L. Stein, which I always love. Hello, I'm R.L. Stein. I write the Goosebumps books. You know, werewolf legends haunted people's dreams for hundreds of years. Our parents and our grandparents love to be scared by the classic werewolf tales. And I hope you will enjoy The Werewolf of Fever Swamp. This house is a straight up health hazard. Think of all the mold from the Florida humidity. What a great space. It's twice as big as your old bedroom, Brady. It's kind of... used. Is this a blood stain? No, that's just, um, dry rot. How the hell would have that gotten there? Cool! Oh, a little corn snake. I'd be thinking this is witchcraft at this point. And I'm not gonna be the one to ruin it. Gee, and the one time I was counting on you. Oh! oh! No TV, but wireless internet. Interesting. Grady, that's really annoying. This is so clearly not a swamp and definitely a northwest forest, but they're trying. Alligators. You know, some of the most successful predators live in swamps and jungles. So how come- the I don't think there'd be any way to interpret this as a friendly greeting. That was trying to kill you? Yeah. Did I hear someone screaming? Whoa. It was Grady, who was being licked to death. Where? This is looking very Blair Witch to me. When last night? Yeah, it was Vandal. Is that what you think? Don't worry. If that swamp permit comes around, Vandal will smell him a mile away. Don't you believe it? 
what's this stuff tied to the trees? That was quite the tumble. Not gonna lie, if I found this, I'd spend hours exploring it too. Right in its very center. A couple of years ago, a kid fell in. Sucked him down like quicksand. What's it feel like? Like green, slimy mashed potatoes. Help, help me! Oh, oh, oh. Oh. This kind of hat was such a thing for a while. I wonder if it's on its way back. The Hermit is a lot more intense in this show. You see anything werewolf? I don't know, it's dark in there. This is me on summer breaks. This hermit is great. It's that swamp hermit, Mom. Did he hurt you? No, not exactly. No, he just tied me up in a net and ate chicken while growling at me. This was a choice I didn't see coming. <laughs> this would be my last night alive if I did that to my mom. Come here, boy! They are straight, mom! Greggy! Open that door! Emily's getting all the good scares in this. I think the werewolf design is pretty great. I just wish the episode was brighter. Will was a little murderer in the episode. Who took my wife and children, everything I ever loved. I would take your heart the way you took mine. The Eclipse stuff is a fun way to reveal its will. Get away! Will! Get away, Grady! Oh. I don't want to hurt you, but I can't help myself, Grady. No! Leave! Now! Go! Ah. Ah! I'm really enjoying the episode a lot more than the book. I like this last jump scare. Yeah, 
You can just tell that Stein's a fun guy. Remember, there's no such thing as a werewolf. Time for me to say goodbye. Have a scary night, everyone. Overall, I thought the Werewolf of Fever Swamp was a big fat disappointment. This is largely due to my own expectations based off the title and cover, but I don't care, I'm punishing the book anyways. Grady was a fine protagonist, even though I found him impulsive and kinda stupid. The real crime of this book is how much time is spent on the damn hermit and various swamp dangers when we could've used more werewolf. Grady woke up to howls like 400 times in this book. It would've been easy to squeeze in at least one sighting. I'm giving this one 2 out of 5 swamp deer. Okay, let's jump to our Goosebumps totals. In addition to its other crimes, the Werewolf of Fever Swamp didn't have much to add to our totals. There were no asshole victims, it's only dreams, or anything to add to the vomit count, but it did have a shoulder scare. The one shoulder scare in this book was when Grady was startled by Will in his backyard, with a shoulder scare that made Grady think the Swamp Hermit had him. This brings our Goosebumps series total to 14. In It's a Prank Bro, Emily shouted quicksand and pushed Grady towards it, only to immediately pull him back, and for some reason Grady thought that someone else was pushing him. This brings our series total to 22 pranks. Getting jiggy with the 90s had one notable 90 moment, and it's probably our most common one, Nintendo. The Raiders and the Discovery Channel were also mentioned, but they're not super 90s to me. Maybe if he had said that the Discovery Channel was awesome, because that's about the last time it was good, before becoming another reality channel. This brings our series total to 72 jiggy 90s moments. The Werewolf of Fever Swap had a ton of chapter cliffhangers, with 16, and I thought these were exceptionally tedious ones. Like they just got rooted in the flow of the story and rarely had anything to do with a goddamn werewolf. This raises our Goosebumps total to 172. The clunky cliffhanger award for this book goes to chapters 2 to 3 with the quicksand prank because I just thought it was stupid. Shocker ending. Our big twist to this story was of course Grady spending the last page transforming into a werewolf after a werewolf bit him earlier. It still kind of feels like a happy ending to me though because Wolf and Were Grady can go wreak havoc on the swamp together. This brings our series total to 10. Well that's it for the Werewolf of Fever Swamp. This is what I get for daring to be excited about a book, a severe lack of werewolves. The next book we have is You Can't Scare Me, which has a really intriguing cover, and I can't seem to remember much about Mud Men, so we'll see how that goes. Be sure to let me know what you thought of the Werewolf of Fever Swamp in the comments. What did you think of all that exciting hermit action? Also, since I've been saying how werewolves are my favorite, what's your favorite horror movie monster? Also, what did you think of my werewolf clips? And don't forget to check out my interview with Mike Vaughn from Geek Fives Nation. Anyways, as always, thanks again for watching, and make sure you subscribe for... The Brag. The Love.